So, yeah, good afternoon and good evening, uh, everybody, and welcome to the 32nd session of the online Optom Learning Series. Ooh, let me just introduce to the speaker today. Uh, today we have Dr. Ramesh, and uh, I think most of the Indian optometrists know him very well. We don't need much of an introduction on uh, who Dr. Ramesh is, but uh, uh, let me let me just get his uh, bio up and introduce the international speaker, uh, international audience for today. Uh, Dr. Ramesh is an Indian optometrist. He is a clinical researcher and he started his academic career in the year 2001 as an academician, as a clinician, and as a researcher in the field of optometry, vision science, and eye care. He is currently an associate professor and the head of department of optometry at the Manipal College of Health Professions, Manipal Academy of Higher Education. He completed his PhD in 2014 at the Bits Pilani, India. His research focus is on glaucoma, and he looked at the five-year progression of glaucoma, both structural as well as functional. And his, he has a lot of publications in the field of glaucoma and others, about, about 18 publications, if I'm not mistaken, with three patents onto his name. Uh, he is also associated internationally with a lot of firms where he is into portable imaging device uh, technology and he's won the gold medal for the best innovation of this particular technology in the year 2013 and has also been nominated as the mentor for that uh, DST Lockheed Martin India Innovation Growth Program in 2015. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, Glaucoma practices post COVID as an optometrist, what should you be, uh, you know, uh, taking into consideration? So, we would like to welcome Dr. Ramesh, and uh, I think the floor is yours. Sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Maroda. Thanks a lot. And good evening uh, uh, to most of uh, uh, the colleagues from the East and, and friends who are joined from the uh, Middle East and West. Good, uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for, for providing me this good opportunity. Uh, I'll be talking today, as Dr. said, on the optometry glaucoma practice because, uh, uh, as in glaucoma uh, uh, conoisium, I would say I, I, I'm, I would want more optometrists to be involved in in primary eye care of glaucoma, being such a huge disease that is there. And with the pandemic that has striking us, this is both an opportunity and also a huge challenge, as many of us would have talked about challenge. So my talk today will cover the basic aspects of how you would refurbish your uh, uh, your clinic, a glaucoma practice, or in your group practices that you are in, how you would adapt yourself when you get back to work, as most of us are starting, uh, as India is, uh, uh, is doing our unlock period one, you know, from lockdown to unlock one. We, that's what the tag that's been given. So when we head back to our offices, we need to follow a new norm, right? So this is a basic talk that's going to talk about the core uh, clinical examinations that we do for glaucoma. Uh, and I will touch upon some key aspects where some technology which are currently available has uh, a, a good role in glaucoma practice. And I have taken the best possible evidences that are there. So to start with, uh, let me give you a disclaimer because uh, many of the statistics that I give on COVID, unfortunately, the disease is so fluent, so fluidic that you know whatever numbers I give now might not be true the next moment even or the next day. And it is important that each one of us, being a global audience today here, it is important that you. Uh, uh, look at your country specific data uh, so that it makes it more relevant to your uh, practice and setting. Sorry. Uh, okay. And I, I do have a financial disclosure to uh, share. I am, uh, I, I have a, I'm a founding director for Vicent Healthcare, and my research and consultancy has been financially supported by iCare company OI in Finland and Remed VR in Poland. 
and I think this sprinkling or the basic uh, uh, ground uh, uh, request has been placed by uh, Mr. Barodawal already, and thanks to all of you. Just uh, uh, bear with me for some more time for the next half an hour uh, uh, so that I can highlight it, and then we, I'll be happy to address any questions and learn with you any good practices that you also have to share. Okay, getting to the core. Glaucoma, we all should understand that glaucoma is a multifactorial optic neuropathy. So it is the disease of the optic nerve. That is the first thing that is very important for us to understand where the disease, uh, the acquired loss of ganglion cells and atrophy to the optic nerve, nerve head leads to an irreversible loss of vision. And one of the important risk factors that can be modified is the intraocular pressure. So IOP is not a causative factor and we, uh, it is a modifiable risk factor, but other factors like family history, race, gender, age, in some cases gender, these are something that are non-modifiable risk factors that are associated with glaucoma. Wow, I'm yearning back to go back. This is the Arabian Sea, uh, uh, from Manipal here, we have a beach which is about 10 kilometers away. We call it's called the Malpe Beach. Uh, really, uh, like you know, my my daughter was asking me to take uh, during pre-COVID era. She was asking me to take there. I was giving reasons uh, uh, that I'm busy and blah blah blah. But now I'm yearning to go back to this beach, get some you know suntan and 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 get my feet wet. Okay, hope the, the unlock period is on and we'll all be getting to our new normal life eventually. So this picture is to also give you an idea. Uh, this is basically a reconnor to see how uh, vision of a normal versus glaucoma appears. In a patient with a healthy normal optic nerve, so, uh, will have no visual field effect and gradually when they start getting glaucoma, uh, this is a very crude depiction of it. Uh, this was done by my PhD student, Ms. Pinas. Uh, thanks to her for sharing these slides. So uh, I like this uh, uh, a small uh, uh, the, the interpretation that she made. Slowly leading to, as the disease progresses, the, the side vision of the patient reduces and finally leads to an irreversible tunnel vision, you know, loss of vision, and patient will just have a central tunnel vision. And that is what we uh, are worried about in patients with glaucoma who need proper care. And this being a chronic disease is not something that is going to be in, in majority of the cases, unless and until it is an uh, angle closure glaucoma, it is usually not an ocular emergency. And over 90% of the patients who walk in in our clinic uh, uh, are asymptomatic, which means that they don't have symptoms. So what does it leave us to? So we as primary eye care clinicians, optometrists across the globe, have a core responsibility to look for early signs of glaucoma because the early you intervene with, in collaboration with the teleconsultation with our colleague, ophthalmology colleagues in glaucoma practice, we can save the patients from becoming blind. That is one of the take home messages that I would want to really bring in because this opportunity that brings us is tele eye care is one thing where glaucoma is a best fit disease because it is not going to make a patient blind tomorrow. And uh, uh, you would, as a primary eye care optometrist, if you want to adopt into a tele eye care practice, uh, I think glaucoma is a very good disease uh, group of patients who would be highly benefited by us capacity building ourselves towards telehealth care. Okay, before we go to telehealth care, which will be one of the topics I would touch upon uh, in the course of this presentation today, uh, let us look at mere IOP measurement is not good enough. So glaucoma needs a comprehensive evaluation. So though COVID or no COVID, there is no compromise on the comprehensive examination. Oh, too many C's, I know. So we need a good tonometric evaluation because that is the only modifiable risk factor, as I shared. So that is the most easiest biomarker that we can use for glaucoma and, and uh, see how we can uh, see whether the patient's uh, disease are under control. 
We need to do gonioscopy because majority of the glaucoma in the in India and in the Asian population are angle a good number of angle closure uh, subsets. So without gonioscopy, which is the most cost effective intervention, we would not be able to decide the course of uh, uh, treat therapeutic approach to these patients. Then the most important thing, since I told you from the beginning, I started with saying glaucoma is a disease of the optic nerve. We have to look at the optic nerve very clearly. Right? Without optic nerve, it will be not possible uh, uh, for us to uh, 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 look at whether there is glaucoma. So both uh, color and the red-free images or red-free evaluation is required. And then if you have better facilities or approach to facility, it is high time the doctor might start looking at getting engaged with an OCT where there is objective measurement of the optic nerve head and subject to assessment of perimetry is something that is very important because at the end of the day, glaucoma is all these risk factors are there, but we end up correlating the structure and the functional loss. What is damaged with the retina? Is there a corresponding visual field? Defect is what we look in. Going down to the next slides. Oh, in it. Yeah. How is COVID an issue with glaucoma? Uh, you could see that, you know, uh, oh, Almost as of this morning, when I was looking at the databases published from the government of India and from Johns Hopkins University, uh, India, we have over uh, 1.74 lakh confirmed cases and, and the global statistics around 6.5. And what is very important here is the report from CDC and, and many of us know that older adults are at higher risk for COVID deaths among those who have been a victim of COVID-19 infection have been elderly population. And that is the same population who are at risk for glaucoma or who, who suffer from glaucoma. In India, approximately around 11.2 million people above the age of 40 are uh, uh, having glaucoma. And the global prevalence is almost a similar thing. And as age increases, there is a higher risk of glaucoma. So what is the AIOS, All India Optimal Society, the committee that gave guidelines for best practice post-COVID, suggests mainly to reduce the, to reduce the COVID risk post, uh, 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 when we start up our clinic, the first thing they said is, elderly glaucoma patients try to reduce the number of hospital visits. Okay, and if they have to come to the hospital, the, the clinic, uh, the optometry clinic or the ophthalmology clinic should have high disinfection standards put in place. So that is what, in my course of this presentation, I'm going to here and there touch upon what has been these recommendations so that when you head back to your clinic, you would have a, 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 a framework of how you should do and you can chop out a more detailed plan for your clinical practice. And more importantly, what was also suggested is reduce the time spent in the clinic by a patient because these patients need to come and as early as possible, try to uh, revamp your clinical schedules. And that is also was highlighted by uh, 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 leaders in ophthalmological uh, practice from Arvind Aike, Dr. Tulsi Ratsar was saying how they are looking at how they can transform their practices so that online they would provide no data, tele eye care, uh, as I say, it's called a flip clinical examination. You know, in academician, we do flip class mode. Now, tele eye care or care is going to be flipped. When the patient is stuck in the traffic, you'll be responding to a lot of history questions during the appointment so that you don't waste a good amount of, you save a lot of time when the patient comes to you in your clinic. So plan every visit of a patient. Appointment systems have to be put in place and a lot of changes have to be made as we go along further in the management of disease. So, as I was sharing, I think telehealth care is something that is going to be the new norm and uh, it is very uh, recommended and uh, it's an opportunity for optometry colleagues, all of you, to adopt a good platform. It can be uh, a very reliable platform where the clinician gets connected with the patient, okay, so that the patient can share 
core details, like you know, history taking details uh, uh, to you before they come. You know, you might, uh, many of you might uh, uh, resonate or agree with what I'm going to say now is that, you know, many times when we ask our patient what uh, medicine they take for the diabetes, they will either say a red pill, I don't know the name of the pill, and, and they might not remember because uh, uh, these are geriatric population who have a higher chance of not remembering uh, due to some of the neurological conditions they can suffer from. And these aspects will be Curtail. If you are having an appointment for a patient earlier, if you have an application, an app, smartphone app that can start collecting data, like you know, take a snapshot of the medicine that you are taking. If they are putting eye drops, you can show. You can ask them to take photographs of it. Even if they are not literate enough to say the name of the drug they are on, they could just take a snapshot of it before they walk into your clinic. So these are small changes that are going to make our life a little more easier when it comes to. Uh, adopt intelli eye care. So the best thing to start with is give an appointment and have an, have an app that will help you connect on. Okay. I would refine, I would recommend you not to use social applications like WhatsApp and things because of data privacy aspects. So it is important that optometric clinics create this uh, or get engaged with tele eye care or electronic health record providers so that we would have a very credible support system that will ensure patient privacy. Anyway, this talk is not about that, so uh, I'm just moving over to the uh, to glaucoma part. The tele eye care is one of my core areas of interest. So, as I told you, the one of the uh, highest, uh, uh, one of the uh, top or uh, modified risk factor is ablation trigonometry or intraocular pressure measurement, right? So, intraocular pressure measurements are a part and parcel of our glaucoma evaluation. So the AOA's guidelines uh, very clearly say uh, that you know when you are doing uh, tonometry, uh, the ablation tonometry probes which you are seeing here, uh, you can connect with the company and ask for uh, disposable probes. Okay, but the challenge of disposable probes is it also increases your clinical examination charges. So disposable probes can be used in case you are not in a position to afford it right now, and uh, you would want to go with the current uh, ablation tonometry prism that you have, then it needs, to under, it needs to go through a series of cleaning process. Disinfection is the key aspects. Our hygiene uh, is, I'm, I'm considering that the day where, when you start a clinic, your hand hygiene would have, would have really improved and you would follow the best recommended health care uh, uh, um, uh, safety measures because 3 to 11, 11 to 13% of healthcare persons are the ones who are affected because of COVID. So it is very important you keep yourself safe. Having said that, what you do with uh, accumulation geometry is not just take a small spirit or, or alcohol swab and wipe it because alcohol swab, 70% uh, IPA solutions uh, which are commercially available are not good enough to sterilize adenovirus or COVID virus or many of the virus. So it is very important you add a, a sodium hypochlorite at least at the start and the end of the day. Okay, so this will be very much feasible if there are you are living in a in India. We call it the green zone, which means that there is no active or uh, live uh, uh, COVID patient in your place, right? In your surrounding area. If that is the kind of scenario, then it would be preferable that you can go with this kind of a practice where you could use an alcohol swab, but in the morning and the evening, if you use a sodium hypochlorite. The uh, concentration is mentioned in the first point here. Okay, so wherein it is basically a 0.5% bleach or sodium hypochlorite, one part of 5% sodium hypochlorite with nine parts of distilled water is what you should dilute or, or you can also use a 3% hydrogen peroxide for five minutes and then wash with the distilled water dry and then mount it at the beginning and end of the cleaning on a daily basis. So the first two points are very important when your practice is more in a kind of a red zone or when there is an active uh, a spring of uh, patients with uh, COVID positive patients in your uh, uh, locality. And I would uh, uh, recommend, I would want you to understand that 
this unfortunate kind of pandemic situation that has uh, is going to be fluidic in nature and since today for example two weeks back udupi was a green zone we were very proud and saying yeah, we are green zone man right and and a uh, couple of flights flew in from uh, the east uh, and also from around the globe and now we are moving into a red zone already so just about 10 days your district will move from a green to red zone and white sea versa will be happening so you need to know what is the best protocol that you have to adopt when you're using appalachian tournament okay so to summarize, when you're using Appalachian Trigonometry, if you're not able to upgrade for a disposable AT probe, then you would need to use a disinfectant solution. Okay. If you are in a red zone, then it's better you you for between every patient, you use a 0.5% sodium hydrochloride. Okay, clean that and do not clean the chin breast or head rest with that because it can cause irritation to the patient next time. And then at the morning, at the beginning of the end of the day, you use hydrogen peroxide, uh, 3% for five minutes. In case you are in a green zone and, and uh, uh, there is no active COVID patient, I, I would propose that you can move to the third point, wherein you could use an isopropyl alcohol solution uh, or, or a small uh, sterile uh, swab that are available. But before you start the day and at the end of the day, it is important you put in sodium hypochlorite. Okay. What about these two? Um, many of uh, you have heard me. Shiads is something that, as a glaucoma uh, uh, clinician or a glaucoma interest researcher, I would, I, I, would, I humbly request, uh, is high time that clinicians or optometrist or anybody in eye care uh, uh, get away and get out of shiaz because especially in covid situation it causes more problem why it is just cleaning the chin dress or head dress is not the problem now now you have to make the patient lie down on a couch the whole couch has to be disinfected right so because formate infection they say from the dress of the patient that there could be a contaminant that could affect the next patient so shiaz is something that i would uh, uh, not want you to practice, but the guidelines which will be shared eventually to you uh, as a post reading material do give a cleaning procedure for shears. I, I, I personally prefer not to highlight that since I, I don't want any of our optometrists uh, to practice shears, so I uh, personally refrain from that. What about ARPOF or ocular response analyzers and things? ARPOF, the problem is during COVID time. Uh, or even then for the next uh, future, future until there is a pandemic production, arc of chronometers and ORAs should not be done because with the burst of an air onto the eye, it, it disperses micro aerosols. So, uh, uh, and COVID infections, unfortunately, even in dormant states can also be in the eye, okay, in the conjunctival flora. Okay, it can lead to dry, uh, a red eye, but even the red eye could be there. So, by just putting a uh, thing you are dispersing the uh, microorganism in the surrounding region and when the next patient comes even though you clean the forehead you might get the other patient affected by touching on the side of the uh, table and things like that so app of chronometer if you have it put it in the lock and key and ask the company that you're not going to touch it for some time and they might need to service and uh, if you have a turn open I think, or if you could uh, invest in a tone of pen, that would be a good option, okay, because it's highly portable. Uh, tone of pens have been shown to have at least 85 or 87 percentage uh, uh, agreement with appellation tonometry in various range of intraocular pressures. But what is very important is this sleeve that you see here. Previously, we used to just wipe it with alcohol, use the same sleeve. Uh, unfortunately, those are some practices that we do in, in major of the uh, places in developing country like India. So it is it will be now advisable that after every patient, you 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 wear a glove and you remove that, put it, and then sterile, uh, and uh, ensure that you are uh, uh, disinfecting your hand or the glove uh, that you have used to remove that. So this is something that could be done. But uh, one of the good tonometers that have been very much shown promise in this kind of a pandemic situation is eye care tonometer, rebound tonometer. 
because reborn chronometer has very less contact on the four, uh, on the patients and we have a distance that could be maintained also okay and then the main aspect is it has a uh, probe that can be disposable and that is something we have to follow very rigorously in post covid patient care in our studies we have shown that eye care ic chronometers this is the model that is there has shown around 0.97 uh, intraclass correlation as compared to oplination chronometer and it is very safe uh, to do very quick and effective uh, iop measurements because one of the key aspects is uh, the time taken to uh, see a patient has to reduce and ik chronometer gives that uh, promising uh, uh, aspect in your clinical practice another thing that uh, in our uh, uh, when i was doing my postdoc at johns hopkins where we were both started working on ik home uh, and this is the publication that uh, came out of that work and then uh, uh, when uh, one of our postgraduate mr anush was also a participant in this uh, uh, Today's talk. His work was to look at IK home. IK home is one of the very robust self chronometers because we want to reduce the unnecessary visit of a patient. If you look at a glaucoma trend, the disease being chronic, many times when, when an ophthalmology colleague changes the drug, they would want a 14 day or a two week IOP check to see whether the new drug is helping us achieve the target IOP or merely after every three months the patient has just come for an iop test these challenges are taken care by eye care home okay the main difference that we got in most of papers were even point one one as compared to operation chronometry so the patients were able to very much repli re uh, reproduce the values that and gap value was got okay so that eye care home chronometer can be easily learned by a patient can be taught to them and you could give it to them in, in uh, learn it to them during whenever they want to do IOP, the machine reaches their home, they could do their IOP measurement as shown in this picture here. And then you will get, and uh, through the app, you will know the real time IOP changes that are there. Another thing that could also help us patients who not only elderly, but some of them who are on uh, steroids, who might have a lower immune, if they come to a glaucoma review, because having steroids, we know that intake of steroids is a risk factor for glaucoma, and they need IOP check. Instead of calling the patient there, IK Bone is a very good tool, wherein in one of our postgraduate study, which is under review now, we looked at the short-term fluctuation of uh, steroid users who were admitted in the hospital for uh, uh, the COPD uh, uh, infections or with uh, dermatological problems or with any skin problems, how did IOP fluctuations happen using eye care home? And we found a very, very reliable, accurate measures using eye care home. So, eye care home is one of the tools that would help you in your clinic. So, if I would put it in a very simple pictorial way, so because chronometry is one of the core and important measurements that we have to do, uh, do, do for glaucoma care. And it is very important that as an optometrist, we select the right tool. So on the y-axis, there are two y-axis in this graph. Uh, on the y-axis, I've talked about COVID safety, which starts from very less safe, uh, and not so safe uh, chronometers to very high safety standards. And those with higher risk of contamination to the lower risk as per the graphs here and if you if i would grade these chronometers the first one in this covid situation that is of less safety with a high rate of contaminants is apple shards uh, is a very risky uh, chronometer where there is a less safety for the patient because you are indenting on the cornea and any in that trigger if you have a microorganism even though you clean it well there is a higher risk of the patient that's why it comes under higher contamination risk population tonometers with either a disposable tonometer head or a well practiced disinfection norm as i told you earlier in my presentation if you follow that then it falls under medium safety and uh, uh, medium risk of contaminants to the uh, next patient so that is something we have to really take care of better ones are tenopin with a disposable sleeve but the ones that pop the uh, uh, the 
uh, the test of time due to COVID infections are eye care pro, eye care chronometer ranges are very good. And I believe eye care home has a new role to play to help avoid unnecessary visit of a glaucoma patient coming to our clinic. Next, glaucoma uh, uh, angle pressure disease screening. So without glenoscopy, it is very difficult to rule in angle closure disease, be it primary angle closure glaucoma or a secondary angle closure glaucoma. The van heavy grading that we do in sit lamps, yes, it's a screening tool, but not a diagnostic tool. It has a very poor sensitivity, and it is better that uh, all optometrists, especially in uh, the uh, practicing in the Asia uh, region, have good competence in doing gonioscopic evaluation. So in this COVID era, it, I would, it would be it is preferable that you would choose one of the indirect gonioscopy lenses. So the COVID precautions that I've been told are as per the woke uh, lens guideline, gonioscope has some coatings, but uh, gonioscope lenses uh, can be washed in running water with soap solution. And it can be dried and wiped too. So this is something that you can do. And uh, uh, if you, you can also take a, a isopropyl alcohol swab or a gaze, uh, uh, soak it uh, and rub it on carefully on the regions which have touched the cornea, right? And the best way, these are useful in green zones, but moment if your region is a red zone, then run into a good uh, uh, practice of sodium hypochloride uh, uh, as explained for tronometry earlier. So it is like soak the lens for minimum 10 minutes. Okay, one part of 5% sodium hypochlorite in nine pounds of distilled water in normal room temperature. That's what Vogue uh, uh, lenses have recommended. In case you are also assisting uh, glaucoma surgery, then mostly they would use a uh, direct uh, gonio lens. That's a Kuiper lens or the goniotomy lenses. The, then they can also be sterilized using ethylene oxide uh, prior to the use in surgery. Is there a disposable option? Uh, this is something that, is, that was not very popular earlier, but thanks to Hatstrick, Hatstrick have something known as Steri Cups. Steri Cups, uh, I've tried in India to get it, but it is there in UK. Uh, uh, in Europe, it is very, uh, it's available. Okay, so basically it, it is a uh, silicon uh, rubber attachment with an optics which doesn't uh, uh, reduce the quality of the glonioscopic procedure, but basically you can flip on to any of the hat streak uh, uh, lenses, uh, glonioscopic lenses, and they are use and throw. Uh, they come in a pack of 64 is what their website has shown. And I think these are things that will also help to ensure that because it is a very important responsibility from our side to gain the confidence of a patient that most of these contact procedures, we are taking very high standards, at least uh, uh, till the stigma is so high that, you know, when I come into an optometric or ophthalmology examination, I would capture an uh, infection from doing these contact procedures. So to rule that out, it is very important that you put in high standards. And eventually, as the pandemic or the risk of co-contamination reduces, you can adapt to best disinfection practices. But I would personally say, uh, uh, if I get hold of these, I think I will put on these sterile cups over to my gonio lenses and, and do it on my patients. I believe this is time where optometry practices, a few of us uh, do have access to ASOCT or Pentacam, uh, because Pentacam is uh, most of the advanced contact lens users, they use it. So it'll be very helpful if you have an OCT or Pentacam, uh, uh, because pachymetry can be avoided, ultrasonic pachymeters will go on touch can be avoided. So you could look into adapting to a non-contact angle closure imaging system. If you uh, have access to one of them for your glaucoma patients, uh, you could recommend that. And maintaining uh, uh, the uh, sterilization or disinfection care for an angle flow or a non-contact OCT or a pentacam machine is relatively easier than gonioscopy, where you just need uh, the surfaces to be cleaned in. And uh, uh, they also uh, uh, advise uh, non-fiber using ethanol, according to manufacturer's advice, uh, between patients to avoid contaminations 
of the holding region and the other region where uh, there could be some aerosol uh, transmission. Coming to optic nerve hits, so we looked at uh, a, a telehistory taking, then tonometry, goniscopy, and the the holy grail of glaucoma evaluation is how do we look at optic nerve head. I am happy that uh, direct ophthalmoscopes are going to go away. Like how I was saying, let's not do shiats. As a glaucoma guy, we need stereo evaluation. And direct ophthalmoscope, we know it doesn't give stereo. And now is the time you keep your direct ophthalmoscope heads, duo heads down. And uh, if you're going for a camp, eventually, I don't know when, but you could take a slit lamp, a portable slit lamp on a 90D instead of a direct ophthalmoscope, because for a direct ophthalmoscope, you'll be too close to the patient and you are at high risk of getting a COVID infection uh, uh, more than co-contamination. So for your own good safety, keep this little boy away from uh, looking at the, opt of the patient's optic nerve. The most useful thing is circular bio microscopy using a stereoscopic view. And uh, the AOS guideline also recommend that in patients with glaucoma suspects uh, or, or those who might not need a perimetry, uh, at this time of peak infection ranges, just take in fundus image or OCT uh, instead of uh, uh, asking them to do a baseline perimetry. So these are some recommendations that have come from the Glaucoma Society of India. That could be only short lived, but you know, as we go along living our lives with this COVID pandemic, we would have a different approach altogether. Yeah. Having said that, imaging is one way, but looking at regular examination, studio by microscopic examination, are very good. So the safety standards have been set for any clinical practice. I think most of the previous speakers would also have highlighted. And the material which I'm going to share with you gives you a detailed two page on how you should safeguard yourself and the patient by having a circlam guard and everything. So the latex glove has to be worn. And then they basically say disinfecting a 90 d lens is again a 0.5% uh, household bleach or sodium hypochlorite. So soak these lenses for 10 minutes and then take it and clean it and ensure that you're not using any rough cleaning procedure because they have uh, uh, anti-reflection coating. So you need to be very careful when you rub onto the surfaces uh, of these uh, lenses. So I would uh, uh, also look in like, you know, we would we can even adapt to portable slit lamp attachments, which were many of us were attaching our iPhones and smartphones to the back of the uh, uh, slit lamp. But now it is also useful that in some patients for home care, if you were looking at how, uh, say, after laser uh, anatomy, how is the pressure and is the PI patent, you can just send in these kind of small uh, attachments the patient can buy and put over this phone and take uh, uh, photographs of the eye and send it to you rather than coming over to your clinic to look for any anti-segment challenges added to that you can also send in an eye care phone that will give you more uh, 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 you know uh, evidence-based thing so another there are many innovations, as you would know, in uh, home-based tele eye care or retinal imaging systems. So, like the ones which are uh, the uh, the the uh, well challenged eye examiner or the peak vision is one thing that I've been very closely following. And the one that I have used very extensively is a DI. So, peak vision is very it was primarily used in. Uh, tele eye care in Africa, South Africa, and many other plates across the globe. And this was one of the pioneering uh, innovations uh, using smartphone. How we can take photograph of the back portion of the eye, especially glaucoma, because glaucoma we need a good image of the optic nerve head to make a best judgment. DI is a good solution. Another portable where you can the patient can do a self uh, uh, retinal imaging. With a little bit of training though so to start with the patient needs a bit of training and then it is very easier for the patient to take uh, the uh, fundus images themselves so but there are not much studies done to uh, evaluate it but i am hopeful and confident that technologies in this range of smartphone adapting optic nerve imaging systems will eventually grow as we speak now uh, considering the uh, need of such a technology similarly 
uh, like a non-contact anti-segment OCT, a non-contact protein segment OCT is something that you have to now adopt too. A frontus imaging system is a long way then a subject to evaluation. So an objective documentation of a fundus photograph, either using your phone onto a set lamp or having any of the portable uh, uh, fundus imaging system will be good. But if you have access to OCT, that is all the more better. Okay, in the glaucoma care. And uh, this talk today is going to cover about the COVID aspects, change in practices that we are looking at uh, in glaucoma care. So I'm not going into the nuances of how you should read a block uh, optic nerve head or, or OCT. And previously, I, I uh, one of my good colleague and good friend, Dr. Rashima, gave a fantastic talk on OCT, uh, intermittent OCT, and, and its application glaucoma earlier uh, uh, last week. So I think that is one YouTube uh, video I would recommend uh, to all. Uh, there is another video by Dr. Sainthan, another good friend of mine. He also had a talk uh, earlier in some other series. Now it's, uh, as we are also having a, a pandemic of COVID, it's also raining a lot of online courses. So uh, you, uh, the content is enormous. So you don't need to uh, wait to come and learn from us. It is more there available. So the last but a significant part of uh, the COVID care presentation is going to be on perimetry because majority of the optometric practices in India and in many countries is related to uh, optometrists are also perimetry uh, perimetrists. So they they ensure that they they provide perimetry care and uh, it is very important that uh, during this peak of pandemic region the crowded diagnostic room should be avoided. So that is something that uh, Lieberman's paper that they highlighted, and uh, that is some administrative decision that if you are working with an ophthalmology center, you have to decide, uh, reduce the number of outpatient uh, rooms and move the uh, perimeters and, and uh, imaging systems in different, different rooms. That is something very important that you should follow, okay? And what I see is like one of the key aspects that uh, we talked about as we started today's talk is reducing the time spent uh, 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 in uh, by a glaucoma patient DM clinic. Okay, one of the core time spent is doing a good perimetry, right? Perimetry is one of the one of the significant time taking procedure because it is subjective in nature. And we have all known about these perimeters, Humphrey groups. Or if I had to list out those who are using octopus, you will have uh, dynamic uh, uh, threshold measurement uh, strategies. So a lot of algorithms are there, which are the mathematical formula behind finding out what is the threshold that a patient sees. But there has been a lot of research over the last two decades on newer algorithms, which are even more quicker than the traditional uh, uh, Humphrey or the octopus and other uh, traditional perimeters. Okay, the ZP adaptive threshold algorithm, one of the uh, commercially available instrument is Hansen 9000 perimeter. Okay, that is available in Europe and also across the globe. So this is, this step takes a minute, okay, uh, to do an perimetric evaluation. So I think the practices from now on, I, I foresee that uh, there will be more adoption uh, like people be open to adopt to newer strategies so that the time taken to do perimetric examination is lessened. So till that change happens, we anyway have to take care because our clinics or your referral diagnostic centers and your own ophthalmology friends clinics would have had invested in a Humphrey perimeter. So let's Humphrey or uh, uh, octopus perimeter. So here I'm going to walk you through what are shared by Humphrey, the step for uh, uh, how you should maintain uh, or lessen the risk of co-contamination or contamination to the next patient uh, in a perimetric evaluation. So between patients, it is very important you wipe the forehead, chin, rest, and uh, follow the uh, local infection control procedures using alcohol swipes, wipes, etc. Okay, so basically you wear a, a glove, a, a latex glove or plastic glove. Wherever is the contact agent, you use isopropyl alcohol and clean the forehead and uh, chin rest and the uh, uh, trigger button. The step two is then you end up lowering the trial head 
and then place uh, uh, a fold a paper to just cover the chin breast and the forehead breast okay insert a short slide and so that the forehead optics paper very simply the paper is kept in uh, uh, and the instrument, the forehead and the chin dress is not affected. When you use, okay, uh, uh, you, they, they, the, uh, here we are not going to use uh, uh, bleaching powder or uh, sodium isopropyl, uh, 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 sodium hydrochloronate. Here we would use an isopropyl alcohol, 70% mist spray solution. So you need to just look for something that forms as a mist because simply you, you you cannot let the droplets fall because that would affect the bow. So what the fifth step they say is, for after you place these papers to uh, uh, avoid contact regions in the chin and the uh, forehead rest, uh, you would look at using the spray without their outer other hand, roll out the forehead optics and slowly using the misting bowl, maintain a distance of 15 centimeter from the bowl and do a sweeping action so that the entire bowl surface will be wet. And next is very important step, blot dry it. Okay, the first thing we do is no, don't scrub off, okay, because these are very, uh, uh, because the whole concept of perimetry is differential light sensitivity. The background has to have the correct intensity so that the, when the light is projected on it, the, the uh, correct amount of light sensitivity can be found out. So you should ensure that there you use a soft cloth or a lens tissue to block and take off those and avoid wiping and rubbing of the bulb. Okay, and wait until isopropyl alcohol dries. It takes about five to 10 minutes before the next patient comes in. So this is, and you can remove the covers and now the Humphrey perimeter is ready for the next patient. So this rigor is very important. Uh, so that the number of perimetric tests that you did will reduce in your clinic. And if in your place or the play workplace, you have uh, more than one perimeters in one room, a small room, it needs to be changed. Okay, minimum, uh, there should be uh, a six uh, feet difference between uh, uh, two perimeters. So, because you're gonna move around uh, the perimeter, uh, uh, often, so it is very important that it is better it is kept in two different rooms. So these are some administrative decisions that you have to recommend to your management so that they could give you the best kind of uh, care and so that the patient who's coming in will be more assured. One of the future opportunity already, one of our uh, uh, good friend, uh, uh, Ms. Maheshwari and the team from other hospitals have already come out with uh, ELISA, which is a virtual reality based uh, 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 perimetry, perimetry screening tool. Similarly, Vivid Vision has tools. So these kind of virtual reality based teleperimeters are going to become reality, but it is going to take a lot of time for us to treat a patient based on these. So these are good screening tools to find early changes or to help uh, uh, address the uh, challenge of uh, remote eye care and tele eye care in places where you cannot have uh, a big perimeter going around. But it might take a little bit of time, but you, uh, nevertheless, an ophthalmology has been the most vibrant uh, 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 innovations in the healthcare domain if you take the last one to 1 1.5 uh, uh, century. Right, ophthalmological innovations have been really high of high standard over the last two to three decades. So now that there's an opportunity, you will see augmented reality, virtual reality systems coming in uh, into real use. And that is something we should be looking forward. So uh, the last part of my talk is going to talk about uh, uh, patient education, uh, glaucoma treatment where uh, I would not talk about the surgery because my competency towards that is not of great, uh, uh, is not high. So I would prefer to uh, get an ophthalmology colleague who's the glaucoma expert to talk about the best changes in surgery. Uh, but looking at telehealth care, which is something that I would want most of our optometric colleagues to capacity build ourselves post our undergraduate and post education is we need to co-manage diseases and the decision making of 
what is the correct treatment that is there is not a simple one to two options it is a complex puzzle as you would see on the right here it is a, the management of glaucoma is a complex puzzle it looks at what is the quality of life what is the stage of the disease etc etc and this query mark unknown is sudden onset of these kind of situations like covid okay so what it comes is taking the chronic nature irreversible damage that could cause the patient needs to be really educated because they need to be adherent compliant and adherence compliance and adherence are two aspects that comes to glaucoma medication the patient has to know that he has to use a good hand hygiene okay if the patient cannot walk every time they put an eye drop if they are having other musculoskeletal problems at least a sanitization uh, process should be done and then they should very carefully store the anti glaucoma medication so that it doesn't come in to reach for any other member uh, who could transfer the formic infection to the cap of the uh, uh, medication those are something that we have to do and then very importantly you also have to show that the patient has to close the uh, nasal lacrimal duct in medical after they put the drop so it is very important they clean their hand very well before doing those things and if uh, a patient is on multiple drugs the the probability of having one of those drug bottle getting uh, covid infections at home and getting it transferred to the eye is higher so you might need to connect with your ophthalmology colleague uh, to ensure that the number of drugs are reduced so that you know there are combination drugs or a higher potent drug or if the disease is very severe they even take them for surgery instead of making the patient put a drug every day okay so these are something as an optometrically you need to look in and provide different instructions or or if you are using tele app give an app based video demonstration and ensure that the patient really understands okay so the crux of what i talk today is to look into how our scope of practice today is the world council of optometry categorizes optometric services across the globe into four different zones and majority of our undergraduate and postgraduate training uh, in india and i would also share in few parts in asia the scope of practice is either without drugs or with drugs that is after diagnostic services dispensing refraction prescription and use of diagnostic drugs like uh, uh, say we could use uh, paracaine to do an uh, diagnostic procedure like chronometry uh, gonioscopic uh, test uh, can be done so this is where we are for us to move and go to this region of ocular therapeutic service uh, it is not just asking for rights uh, from the uh, uh, authorities but it is more of responsibility that we need to really look in capacity build on on on, on uh, Uh, on our current competency not just knowledge it is about the skill clinical decision making the attitude the knowledge of drugs everything and one core way is developing and i think uh, a higher education institutes like manipal academy of higher education and and uh, 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 many other institutions across the globe should look at bringing in uh, a work integrated training modules uh, uh, for uh, tele i care Uh, so that glaucoma co-management can become a reality and not just a taboo, uh, which is the need of the hour. So there is a huge scope of optometrists in glaucoma care, and many of you who are here might be doing as a technical help here and there. But I would urge you to take a more deeper look because this is a chronic disease, which starts at about age forty. Suddenly there is changes that happen. and we have earlier techniques you know advanced techniques imaging techniques that can find out uh, uh, early asymptomatic disease stage and then start intervention through tele eye care so that the patient doesn't get blind okay so uh, i this by the last slide of my presentation i thank uh, the uh, the organizers and all of you for your patient hearing i think it's been almost a 50 minute presentation now uh, i'm open for questions i hope this was informative to most of you uh, when you would want to go back into your practice uh, post covid and uh,
we have all stayed well, stayed safe and stayed, uh, stayed healthy, but now we need to go back to work and also stay healthy. So good luck with that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for this. Uh, I think definitely we all learned a lot of things in terms of uh, managing COVID, uh, managing glaucoma post COVID, of course. And uh, there are a couple of questions here. I'll just read out uh, for you. Uh, yeah. The first question uh, is asking about perimetry. I think, uh, do we need to keep the op uh, doors open? Uh, what do you suggest when it comes to doing a perimetry test? Do we need to keep the doors yeah. and the windows open or should we keep it closed? Yeah, that's, uh, I think keeping and uh, uh, most of the uh, the best recommendations are uh, towards like, for example, uh, the All India Aftermo Society recommendation or the Glaucoma Society of India or the uh, World Glaucoma Association. Do not say uh, that as a recommendation. The biggest, there are two challenges to it. It depends on your practice. If you have ambient noises, there are going to be less because most older patients can't hear, and more the distraction, they are almost like our kids. Okay, they don't they don't concentrate on the perimetry, right? You know, so it is a compromise on if your environment is so that there will not be any other interference. Somebody should not come and say, call the other patient if you keep the doors open. Okay. If this might be Chatter Chatterjee who's sitting in, they'll be calling other Chatterjee and he will stand up and go. You know, that's a distraction that needs to be avoided. So most of the uh, uh, um, practices uh, uh, prefer closed door because it needs light. The second challenge is lighting. The moment you open up, it is going to be illuminated. You're not having a dark room and perimeters need certain illumination standards to be maintained. But in case if you can handle these two challenges, Keeping it open is okay, but the biggest problem is uh, perimeter is, is is a closed environment and you sweat a lot. Okay, I sweat for even in this AC environment and doing perimeter, the patient sweats a lot. So it is very important you have an air conditioning that is done. And there are recommendations uh, for centralized air conditioning, how you can make it even more better. So it is not like, you know, keeping an AC on is going to be more challenging. But if you look at malls, they are reinventing their whole cooling systems to a more healthy thing. So it is a compromise. It is not a yes or no answer. It depends on how your clinical, uh, the place where you have kept your perimetry is, and if it can ensure the uh, uh, illumination requirement as per the uh, calibration requirement of the perimeter, and the noise standards which doesn't distract the patient, you can keep it open. Uh, that's um, I hope I've answered that question. Yeah, and the other question is about the disinfecting system. I think you have covered uh, in detail about disinfecting the eye care, uh, the tonometers in general. But is there any way we can disinfect the eye care tonometer probe before checking? Uh, see. Previously, we used to, uh, the, the challenge with those probes is if you would uh, just give me one second, I can show you a probe. Yeah. In the meantime, I think he, he will just get some probe and uh, I think he will demonstrate to us. If there are any questions, please uh, post it up and we would be happy to take them. Yeah. So uh, if you could see here, this is one of the eye care probes that are there. So uh, these probes are very uh, flimsy and thin, right? You know, it's it's uh, it needs that metallic thing to keep it floating for the rebound to happen, okay? Previously, we used to just take it very carefully and use isopropyl alcohol and use it. But now with COVID challenges, uh, uh, it is recommended uh, from the All India Ophthalmology Society, think that you throw away this, discard this probe after every use. Okay, an eye care probe. If you're looking at a disposable AT head, uh, this is a lot more cheaper and affordable. Yeah, I think yeah, that that's it's very flimsy. I think if you even you can yeah. even break it probably while while just uh, you know wiping it out. Sometimes. Right. So if you bend the whole thing, the pressure values are different. And RP also asks whether uh, I care probe before the checking uh, for other eye. 
mostly it is not required there is a I think Aarti's good question was checking the other eye too uh, yes. uh, 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 because we are using the same patient and they are in the same risk and uh, uh, only between patients it has been mainly recommended I'm sorry, I'm also reading the chat uh, questions parallelly. And thanks to Rashima, yes, Dr. Rashima, there is a tele perimeter having kinetic mode also. And there are new algorithms that are going to come with kinetic to static very quickly. And that was one of the work of Dr. Shondraj. Uh, so uh, there are new perimeters, but the biggest challenge is are we going to take it and change the way we can treat a patient? That's a question mark there. Eh? needs more research so i think that's where we uh, as a research team you, uh, you and uh, all of us uh, should be looking at uh yes sir uh yeah. yes uh, over to you you can read the questions here yeah i'll just i'll just uh, scroll and see uh, uh somebody is asking what is nld occlusion i think uh, okay so natural lacrimal duct the partial yes. occlusion hmm. sorry that's for the uh, unnecessary short forms Sorry, Maheshwari, uh, 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 for doing that. Basically, after putting eye drop, they need to learn to just uh, close the punctum, the nasal punctum, nasal lacrimal duct, so that there will be lesser systemic absorption, thereby reducing the effect of the uh, drug, uh, ocular drug, on its systemic influences. That's right. Yeah. And this is a very interesting question, I think. Uh, Normally, we have been told that we should not be touching the bowl of the perimeter, but yeah. now since because of this, we need to, you know, touch and clean or, you know, dab it, not, not to, as you mentioned, we don't have to scratch or anything, we just need to dab it. Will it not affect the calibration of the perimeter? Yes, that is, that is the, one of the reasons why they are not giving bleach there. If you look at it, they are asking us to Humphrey, uh, because it is a kind of uh, risk to benefit kind of assessment. Without doing, you will infect the next patient, which is more harmful to your practice. Okay, and these are guidelines. You follow the guidelines given by Humphrey team only. So ensure that you have the same uh, 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 recommendations by your manufacturer. Connect with them to ask them to give you a, a more detailed uh, worksheet so that if you follow the same things, I think they shouldn't stop you from supporting on insurance and other things. But it, it will if you scrub. If you find a small dirt there and there's something that is sticking on the on the bowl, please don't scrub it. So it's better you stop the perimeter, cancel appointments, and call your uh, 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 Zeiss or octopus engineer who has better methods to ensure. Uh, but yes, that is some risk that we are taking. Uh, will the bowl go? We uh, uh, we hope they have done good research. Humphrey team knows. Uh, 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 that you know that should not affect it much yeah i think when you compare the risk of covid versus the risk of that i think uh, that's also one of the thing to look at because covid i think is more risky but uh, yeah, uh, the other question here is uh, uh, can you diagnose glaucoma without any equipment wow Huh. Uh, if you look at evidence-based care, that is one big challenge. You know, glaucoma, uh, previously in a very end stage glaucoma, people used to look at it even, you know, by just even digital chronometer we used to measure earlier. But the kind of chronic nature of the disease, as, as I showed you, like, you know, if you're looking at this kind of, and I call it the black rainbow, okay? If you're looking at diagnosing apoptotic changes uh, at the ganglion cell level and to look at where is the optic nerve changes much earlier because we know that the earlier you diagnose, you can ensure that the patient doesn't become blind. Okay, there is good evidence on that. Okay, there are, there are randomized controlled studies uh, that have helped us prove. So to do all these things, I, I do not see uh, a role without an, uh, any equipment because technology is something that has really helped us understand especially emerging technology so instead of probably eventually in the future a chronometric evaluation might become redundant but that is again a very hypothetical uh, statement which i'm sharing now please do not quote me anywhere saying that ramesh says chronometers away because one of my funding agencies is a chronometer guy 
So uh, uh, neither am I promoting him too much, but nor am I saying that thing. But imaging is one very key aspect that has helped us understand what is happening at the thyroid level, what is happening at the lamina fibrosa, what is happening even at the ganglion cell level on a living retinal tissue. OCT, high end OCTs, ultra high resolution OCTs, which are going to become more reality, affordable eventually in the future, is to look at these ganglion cells and predict the risk of them getting blind. Because the problem of this disease is 90% it is asymptomatic. Patient does not know. And to, we are the magicians or we are the clinicians who can help them know that. So, Mohammed Junaid, uh, I mean, uh, Siddha, uh, Siddha Prakash uh, ji, I think, uh, glaucoma without equipment, utopian dream. I don't see any other future without that. Yeah. And what's your take on portable perimeters? Would that be a, a useful tool in the present scenario? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so if I if I may address the next question also, uh, and then I'll come to this question, uh, if you permit me. So yes, Mohammed yes, yes. sir has asked the reason we are non-midriatic fundus examination. Um, one advantage, like you know, the the uh, most of the non midriatic fundus evaluation has advantages. One, if there is a patient with an angle closure at his glaucoma, then without dilating the eye, I could do use a non midriatic fundus examination. But that is having said that, the biggest limitation is this is almost a 2D image only. It can give you red free images along with color. So that is how we use certain algorithms and, and, and even critical evaluation can help uh, look at changes in the glaucoma optic nerve. But I, the most preferred is a dilated vidriatic fundus where you can take a stereo image, take it one end of the dilated pupil, other end. That is the most best one. But in times where you have to spend less time for a patient coming into your clinic, that is the first goal that we are looking at because the, the older the patient, they are at risk for COVID deaths, so they should not get a COVID infection from anywhere in the vicinity of your clinic. So coming to your practice, they should not get affected is what your aim is. Then a non mediatic fundus imaging system makes it more quicker. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you had asked me on uh, the good question on portable perimeters. Yes. yes. So if you look at it, the Henson perimeter is relatively portable. The uh, virtual reality perimeters are even uh, very portable though. So but again, as I told you, all these are are not at the, uh, currently there's no evidence to replace uh, the, uh, the, the believed standard of CETA standards and CETA fasters or, or octopus perimeters. But yes, that is a good feature for it. Okay, and somebody is asking about the cleaning procedure. So I think this session is recorded and uh, probably they can go back and, uh, you know, have a look at what you have explained it uh, thoroughly before. Uh, right. The other thing is the right. connection I'm question. also sharing, you, you, you can please share the PDF that I've shared because I yes. uh, open those available from L&D Optima Society and also from Journal of Glaucoma. So, yes, so we will be sending out to the to the participants the additional reading materials what you have already shared with us. Yeah. And uh, one more question following the cleaning procedure. I think there are two questions which relates to that. So it feels that the, the virus will is going to settle down onto the bowl and the patient isn't going to really touch the bowl as such when it comes to perimetry. So should we really be bothered about cleaning it? and What's your take on cleaning it with the UV light, which could be fitted yeah. onto the instrument? Again, yeah, uh, considering that it is an, uh, COVID is an aerosol infection, even if you uh, clean the uh, forehead and the chin rest, that would be the best first approach. But what is the problem is, most of the conventional perimetric things are about five minutes, uh, for three to four minutes of time, right? Uh, uh, one eye, they takes about four minutes at least. For a CETA standard, or if you're using a CETA faster, it takes a minute or so. And uh, though it is, uh, the patient is not going to touch, and there is going to be a frequent change in the next patient with every breathe that happens, it is a confirmed zone, right? You are putting yourself in a closed zone, and there's a breathing happening, so there's a slightly higher risk, is what 
the predictions are. But there is no data to really support it. So the best practices what were given by Humphrey uh, uh, field analyzer or the uh, theme from Zeiss is what I showed you in those 10 sets. And if you see, the, you had a, the Humphrey team's person who was uh, showing you how to do those things. Yes, the blocking methods and things have to be very carefully done. Again, UV light, the biggest challenge with UV light is uh, uh, you cannot have a person uh, being there. Uh, the, 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 the patient or the caregiver or, or you as a clinician should not be too much exposed to the UV light. And these sensitive sensors that are there, because these are optical uh, sensors, that can be affected probably. But I do not know the reason why UV light has not been uh, 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 used in uh, disinfecting and perimeter. But when you are looking at disinfecting UV rays, using UV rays in your clinic, you cannot do it in the presence of a patient. It can be done as a terminal procedure. That is, you can, and UV light has to fall in every place. In your clinic so you have to have a uv lamp and you can keep it in your room and you can close and go and that is what is the best procedure i would believe in so uh, to answer siddhar i do not know why it is i i, pray, I assume that it is both because of uh, the uh, influence that uv light can have make to the sensors and the optical uh, uh, aspects that are there in the perimeter that's right yeah and uh, we'll just take one, one or two last questions, mostly related to the talk today. Uh, what's your take on doing perimetry with the mask on? Because normally when you have a mask, it fogs the lens. So would you have any recommendation? Should the patient be wearing the mask or? Uh, the biggest challenge is the type of mask that we have. So we find using a surgical mask, you know, uh, uh, Already the patient has got inferior arcuate defects. And if I'm going to wear a mask like this, it stops. And COVID and other masks are even more conical. So you are adding an extra confounder to the perimetric evaluation. You're not know whether the new inferior defects that you're getting nasally uh, are because of uh, the mask or is it the disease? So that is the biggest problem that you know while doing, you should wear a mask. So that you don't uh, think, but for the patient while doing perimeter, he has to uh, keep it open. That's right. And what do you think would be advantages or disadvantages of the digital control tonometer over the Goldman uh, in, in this particular time? Uh, beautiful. So dynamic contact tonometer is a fabulous uh, technology that can help. Uh, we don't need a pachymetry. It can give you the true intraocular pressure measurements, and it's uh, uh, pretty much uh, expensive than the conventional gold pressure tonometer. Simply, the uh, the tonometer probe is more sensitive. The uh, I think uh, disinfection procedures. It's better you connect with the respective uh, 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 distributor or the manufacturer for updates on how you should disinfect it, and. Uh, in Goldman Operation Tonometer, the AOA is guideline, they say use a, a replaceable or a disposable probe. So every time you do a perimeter tonometer, you change, take the probe, throw it away, and put a new probe. And that would not be possible with dynamic counter probe. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, we would, uh, we have taken almost all the question based on the topic. Thank you very much, sir. Is there anything which you would like to address specifically if you uh, uh, I've, I've already, uh, you know, taken 50 minutes of their good time on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, talking good on glaucoma, glaucoma. I feel happy about talking glaucoma, but uh, I've shared most of what I wanted to uh, address, and I hope yeah. this was informative. Yes. And uh, indeed, it was. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for taking up this time. And so thank you again uh, from the team online Optum Learning Series. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh, for uh, enlightening us with this very informative talk. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just stay uh, healthy. Yeah. Yeah, please. Stay, uh, please, please be safe and stay healthy. That's that's the uh, whole message across to be spread. And we do have sessions uh, next weekend as well. So please. Uh, we will send you emails for that so please look out on your emails and the whatsapp group for the future sessions 
thank you very much uh, to everyone for attending stay home stay safe and see you all again next week bye